Hello guys, today's talk is going to be about the necessity of the object, something that I've been sort of reeling in from reading Buber and sort of always <laughs> re-looking and re-reading um, Buber's I and Thou, which is um, always illuminating to me when I am constantly confronting it. Um, but specifically, what we have here today um, is going to be a couple sections from Between Man and Man um, from Martin Buber and I and Thou. And so where do we begin with, uh, well actually it wouldn't be where, but I think a, a good place to begin with showing the necessity of the object for Buber would be in Between Man and Man it, on his critique of Kierkegaard where he quotes him in saying this. He says, quoting Kierkegaard, in order to come to love, says Kierkegaard, about his renunciation of Regina Olsen, I had to remove the object that is sublimely to misunderstand God. Creation is not a hurdle on the road to God. It is the road itself. We are created along with one another and directed to a life with one another. Creatures are placed in my way so that I, their fellow creature, by means of them and with them find the way to God. A God reached by their exclusion would not be the God of all lives in whom all life is fulfilled. A God in whom only the parallel lines of single approaches intersect is more akin to the God of the philosophers than to the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God wants us to come to him by means of the reginas he has created and not by the renunciation of them. If we remove the object, then we have removed the object altogether. Without an object, artificially producing the object from the abundance of the human spirit and calling it God, this love has its being in the void. So, <laughs> Buber, Buber seems to be pointing out the fact that if, and he, he makes this critique also in I and Thou, where the renunciation of an object is to assume in some fashion that there is a higher order of objects, right? So that means you make, by the very fact of renunciating an object, you make God himself into an object. Because what, what you're doing implicitly is by saying that there is obviously a better object. Um, and this is what Buber would say. And then Buber would also say, as, as he just made the example of Kierkegaard and Regina, is that we cannot look at things, people, places, anything else as sort of objects in the way of us to from you know in the way of between us and God, right? It's it's there is no there is no obstacle per se that needs to be removed. Now, what's interesting is, I, and I've never done this kind of reading before, but perhaps what, it, what Buber is asking of us is actually the object itself needs to be confronted, which is entirely different from being used and enjoyed. What does it mean to confront? Um, this is something that I think Buber... I mean, this is something right now that I cannot answer, but it is something worth dwelling on. What does it mean to confront um, an object rather than push it away, right? 
this would be instead of removing the obstacle, you confront the obstacle, right? And I think what Buber is trying to say in all this is that once you confront and you don't remove the object, then you realize that the object itself is the way, is the way towards God. Um, I'll give another example of what Buber says in I and Thou, because I also think it's very important that we kind of read this section right here. So Buber says here in a translation by Kaufman, um, he says, A subject that annuls the object to rise above it annuls its own actuality. So there is this like very interesting um, paradox here, right, that Buber is pointing out. He's basically saying, like, if we, take, if we take literally, like, everything is God's creation, right? That means if you try to, like, annul it, if you try to annul this, what you're doing is you're actually annulling God's creation, right? So you're, you're caught, you've caught yourself in a paradox of trying to annul an object in order to get somewhere. And it's in this very trying to get somewhere that you end up simply just, you know, having, a, you know, probably no, no respect for creation, right? God's own things and, and what God made. Which um, brings a very fruitful thought in all of this, mainly because Nietzsche, Nietzsche does a move where, you know, he says the human being must be overcome, right? We have to become this overman. But if we combine Buber with his own thinking, you can see that actually this aiming towards um, overcoming the human is the very disregard for human as creation itself. That, that would be the sort of paradox or contradiction that perhaps Buber would be pointing out. Um, that the human being is not something that must be overcome. The human being is itself the way and not an obstacle that needs to be um, removed by its own overcoming. I think that's what Buber would say, honestly, in, in, in sort of response to Nietzsche. But of course, there's a lot of nuance about, you know, if we really think about the overman seriously as a bridge, right? then the overman is both impossible and possible. That means that the overman itself is always this Im impossible possibility, essentially, right? Because you have to have some type of category to sort of aim forward towards, right? Um, and, and this is where Buber... Buber's understanding of relation is helpful because our instinct for relations is what Buber calls, uh, you know, our inborn thou. Our instinct for relation is always for the aim of relation itself. So I guess if we were to sort of like combine like a Buber Nietzschean way, it would, it would be the translation would be that the overman is already sort of within the human being itself, and that is what, the, the, the aim is always for that specific relation. But you see, the overman by itself, it, it's very difficult to actually include relation. 
Um, but I mean, there, there's a lot of, again, there's no definite interpretations here. Um, but it is some interesting proposals about like how one would respond to the other. How Buber would even consider like the overman, right? And I think that's a danger. If we actually take seriously like this, the human being needs to be overcome as if it were an obstacle, then I think Buber would be in disagreement. If we interpret the human being as an obstacle in which it needs to be overcome, then we are very, very much degrading the human being in the very act of doing so. Um, so, so this is, I mean, so this is actually like just a very interesting, um, I, I guess what could be proposed, right, is, you know, Buber... Buber is a fan of doing nothing, but his doing nothing is more of a of a waiting, which is I think a helpful distinction because you know you can mindlessly do nothing, but and that can be your intent as well to just mindlessly do nothing, but then there's this sort of intentful nothingness which is waiting. Waiting. And I think there's a nice correspondence between waiting and listening that is very pivotal to the dialogical relationships that Buber wants us to get into. Like, if we really th think about conversation, in order for there to be like an actual conversation and an actual exchange, one has to be listening and not hearing. Um, and one has to not just, um, you know, and, and I think not just do nothing while the person is speaking, but waiting, right? Waiting. Because um, I think hearing and doing nothing is, are something that we can do mindlessly. But listening... And waiting, that's always things that we can do intentfully. Um, so there, there seems to be this, com uh, this combination of listening and waiting that is very important about how, how do we actually come to action in a real sense. And I think that's what Buber also wants to show us. But anyways, yeah, I, I really wanted to stress the... The, the notion of the necessity of the object because even in another translation of I am thou that I have I believe it's the I forget which translation this is it is Okay, I can't find it. But anyways, it's, I know it's a very, like, it's a basic, it doesn't, <laughs> it's not printed anymore. Um, the kind of translation that I have, actually, it's not, it's not done anymore in, in print. Um, so I was very lucky to find it in a, in a bookstore, you know, kind of an old bookstore. But anyways, um, th in this translation that I have, the one that's not from Kaufman, um, it says here, the subject deprives, the subject deprived of its object is deprived of its reality. So y you see what's, what's going on here with the necessity of the object is that actually the moment that you re try to remove the object, the moment you, you, re you re try to remove the obstacle, you're actually depriving the object of itself, the object itself of its own reality. Right? And so this this really goes deep into like spiritual practice of like, you know, I need to renounce the world and just be in my love for God, right? Buber would be saying, no, the moment you do that, 
is the moment you deprive everything else of its reality. Right? Because now what you're doing is now in, in, in some real sense, now you're actually treating it as an object in some real sense. Where it has nothing to do with you. So you just remove it. And I think what Buber is trying to say is no. Everything that is quote quote an object has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with you because you're always bounded up by that sort of relation. You're, it's always bounded up by the fact of its own lived actuality. So for you to remove it is to undermine its own lived actuality. Just because you perceive it as an object, consciously or unconsciously, doesn't mean it's okay for you to remove it and dispose of it as if it were, as if it didn't have its own lived actuality. Um, and, and I think, I mean, this is, I mean, it's, it's been quoted, Buber aims for a sort of mystical everydayness, but again, it's, I, I think the way we approach the object, I, if anything, that, that is the aim of this talk, it's the way that we approach the object that matters, right? Buber, Buber is advocating this sort of waiting and listening, right? Rather than removing and sort of using and trying to experience, right? All, all this stuff, using, trying to experience... This is all under objects of enjoyment, right? You, you can make an object, any object, into an object of enjoyment. Um, and, and this is what Buber has a problem with. And if, and if we go into psychoanalysis, we know this is true. We always have an object of enjoyment. But the whole point is to sort of change the attitude, do this turning Right? Don't make it anymore into an object of enjoyment. Make it into the way, into the way. The object of enjoyment is itself the path, the way. Um, so it is this turning. It's not something that you need to prevent yourself from. Um, of course, I think there's a lot of, you know... <laughs> I think a very superficial kind of like understanding of what I'm saying would kind of go into, well, if someone's doing drugs, right, wouldn't that be their object of enjoyment? So wouldn't um, the, you know, the use of drugs be sort of like, wouldn't, they, wouldn't that make them use drugs more because now it becomes their way, you know, instead of removing it? Well... I, I think the drug example is, is a good example, but at the same time, if we actually look at why the person is doing drugs, most of the time when people do drugs, they're doing drugs to sort of avoid something. In fact, actually, this is the irony, right? Most people do drugs to sort of remove an obstacle in their life, to sort of um, alleviate an obstacle in their life, right? So is this, again, it has the same mentality as this alleviation rather than actually confronting, right? Whatever they're trying to avoid, whatever they're trying to sort of alleviate as the obstacle in their lives, Buber would say that is, that is their way. The obstacle itself, that is their way. The drugs, the drugs is more of like the secondary repercussions of the, the obstacle. Um, But I, I guess if, if we are to just think about objects of enjoyment, it wouldn't be our immediate acknowledgement of objects of enjoyment. It would be what we perceive immediately as the obstacle, right? What is the, what is the lived actual obstacle? What is, it, what is it that things that we are trying to avoid, right? Any, any source of addiction, I would say, is rooted in some type of detriment, not to their, not to their own fault, but... To some type of detriment to which they attempt to avoid the object, the, the obstacle. Um, and so they, they end up building themselves an identity out of that of very avoidance, 
you know, doing drugs, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a drug addict, and so on and so on. Um, but of course, there's a lot of nuances with, you know, we could argue, well, someone's born an addict because it runs in their family and so on and so on. So it's actually, you know, um, but yeah, I think, again, there's a lot of nuances to that argument that could be added and back and forth. But I think it's just important that if we take the basic premise that everything is God's creation, right, at least in Buber's understanding, then the renunciation of the object is basically the renunciation of creation itself. Rather, the real way, the real way of suffering, right, is this sort of confrontation, this meeting, um, where this meeting and this confrontation becomes the way. Right? So the object itself is, is already your way. The, the obstacle is, is, your, is your way. Um, I, I think this really stresses conditionality, right? Where all of us have different obstacles, our particular obstacles. And so in that sense, we always have already made our, our way. Our way is always being presented. And, and I think, um, if anything, I, I'd, I'd want people to sort of take this from Buber, is that our way is already set. The obstacles are there. That is the way. You know, so... Anyways, hope you guys enjoyed this. All right, take care.